Okay, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Uh, my name is Liming Wang. I'm co-hosting the seminar with Dr. Miguel Figuinezzi from the engineering site. And for today, we're very pleased to have a visiting scholar to speak on a topic I believe a lot of us will be very interested. Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Eleni Christopher. Uh, Dr. Christopher is a uh, assistant professor at civil and environmental engineering at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, for today, she will talk about addressing the data challenge from bike crash analysis. For that, I will give the room to Dr. Christopher. Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm very excited to be here and share with you um, some recent research I've been doing on bicycle safety and bicycle demand estimation models. So needless to say, we need to improve safety for non-motorized users, in particular for bicyclists. Um, not only because we have more and more uh, bicyclists out there on the roads um, over the last few years, but also because we want to encourage more people to uh, use bikes as their, mo as their main mode of transportation in, in order to meet sustainability objectives that a lot of cities have been setting. Um, However, safety and perceived safety is often cited one of the main reasons of, uh, for people not being willing to try um, bicycling. And um, that is also justified by the fact that um, a lot of uh, crashes lead to um, deaths and serious injuries. So in 2014, there were, about, there were more than 700 um, deaths, um, bicy bicyclists that died, and um, more than 50,000 injuries. Um, so an interesting aspect that is often um, overseen, probably um, due to lack of data, is the fact that bicyclists are exposed both to other uh, bicyclists and motorized vehicles. So this is something we had in mind when we were um, starting this research. Um, we wanted to capture basically this double exposure of bicyclists to other users. Uh, with the advent of new technologies, we um, get to have more and more data that can um, assist in addressing um, safety issues and also bicycle demand estimation. So um, we have availability of data through bike sharing systems, through continuous or short-term counters, um, and also mobile bi bicycle data is something that is um, becoming more and more uh, prevalent. However, a lot of these data sets often um, suffer from common data issues, right? So th we, we don't have data for every single location and Certainly data are not as available as they are for cars. Um, and also a lot of times the counters are malfunctioning or um, we've, um, so we have lost communication so we don't get to obtain data for all locations we would like to or on the long time intervals that would be ideal. Um, so data challenges associated specifically um, with um, addressing um, bike issues are the fact, uh, bike safety issues are the, the fact that um, a lot of the, the, we have data, a lot of data, but those are still a fraction of the motorized vehicle data we have. Um, our data, uh, bike data present uh, seasonality, bike demand data present seasonality. So here you see a graph, I'm gonna be talking a lot more about it um, over the course of this presentation, um, that shows that there are se there's seasonality in demand. So you have lower demands during the winter months and higher demand, bike demand during the um, summer months. So that's something we need to consider when um, we're collecting data. You cannot just collect data over the summer and say that's my demand for the whole year. Um, and another thing that's not necessarily addressed through this work, uh, but a lot of times bicyclists are, not, are riding um, off path on um, sidewalks and so you, we don't get to observe those bicyclists or um, the issues that are associated um, with them. Um, so starting with the crash rate, um, a commonly used crash rate equation is the one shown here. Um, so the crash rate R is um, expressed in crashes per million vehicles and it's a function of the average number of crashes per year and the average volume um, as expressed by the annual average daily traffic. Uh, often instead of utilizing the average volume of vehicles per day, we also um, utilize the average volume of bicyclists uh, per day and use the same equation to express 
uh, crash rates as a function of the volume of bicyclists. Um, the problem with this um, equation is that it's justified, justified based on an assumption that at locations that you have a lot of uh, motorized, a lot of car traffic, you're also going to have a lot of bike traffic. But um, as you probably know, that's not necessarily true. So what this figure shows, um, on the y-axis we have plotted the annual average daily bicycles, bicycle traffic, and on the x-axis the um, annual average daily traffic um, for cars. So you see that there are locations that have very high car demands but not necessarily high bicycle volumes and vice versa. So that, that's what motivated um, this work to try to investigate if there's a way to basically combine the um, crash rate, those two crash rates and account, accounting for both um, demand of uh, bikes and cars. This is another graph that illustrates that um, as the annual average daily bicycle traffic or the annual average daily traffic increases, um, it shows the, the uh, bicycle cra crash frequency um, on how the bi bicycle crash frequency changes. So yes, there is some correlation between high car uh, demands and high bicycle demands and crash rates, but there's nothing, no clear re relationship we can conclude from this. Um, so the objective of our study was to assess bicycle crash risk, accounting for the double exposures that bicyclists have, uh, both um, uh, because they interact with cars and other bicyclists. And also data challenges related to the seasonality of bicycle demand and the lack of continuous count data um, in multiple locations in certain areas. So here is the crash rate uh, we are proposing. Um, so it's basically the um, constant term is squared and we divide, in addition to dividing by the annual average daily traffic, we also divide by the annual average um, uh, bicycle traffic. So before um, I show you the results from the study we performed, um, I would like to walk you through the framework we developed in order to be able to um, utilize this methodology for estimating crash rates even when we don't have a lot of data and we don't have continuous count data. So um, we start by estimating the annual average daily bicycle traffic through a sinusoidal bicycle estimation, uh, demand estimation model that we developed that I'm going to spend uh, a decent amount of time uh, describing. And then we utilize what we call corridor assignments uh, in order to match the locations we have demand bike and um, car demand data with the locations we have crash data. And finally, we perform the crash analysis with the equation I just presented. Um, so specifically for this uh, research, we have utilized data from um, Cambridge, Massachusetts for the crash um, rate um, estimation. And in particular, we utilized 2012 AADT um, data um, available through the, through the Massachusetts Department of Transportation website. And bicycle data were available in 30 locations, 28 locations um, were manual peak hour counts. And two locations we had continuous count data. Um, and those uh, were available through the city of Cambridge and uh, the Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization. For bicycle crash data, we only had access to crashes that are reported to um, the police. And those are only when those crashes are between bikes and vehicles. So they have some, a certain value of um, uh, property damage or uh, lead to hospitalizations. Um, so um, the location again of the data was in Cambridge for a time interval between 2011 and 2014, and we had 622 bicycle crash, uh, bicycle vehicle crashes. Um, and the data were available through the UMass Safety Data Warehouse um, that collects uh, crash reports, hospitalization data, citations, and so on. It's a very big database we um, have at UMass. Um, so I will start with uh, presenting the first step of this framework um, that is related to estimating the annual average daily traffic. Um, and that process includes four steps. So we started by basically collecting bicycle demand data from continuous counts and short-term counts and whatever we could basically find out there. And we continued also with collecting bike share data. Um, I find this really exciting because I find it that it's much easier to find 
bicycle data or people are more willing to give you bicycle data than any other type of data that exists out there. So it's exciting times. Um, then we try to basically plot the data to see if we can um, identify any known pattern, any function that could be describing how the, the demand changes over um, the different months. And we proceeded with model calibration and validation that we'll explain um, in more detail in the next um, slides. Um, so here is a summary of the bicycle counts, and uh, the next slide has a summary of the bicycle sharing data we had available. So we had 12 locations in Ottawa, um, one in Cambridge, 21 in Arlington, Virginia, six from Portland, um, Oregon. When I say Portland on the East Coast, they assume Maine, so I always have to be specific. Um, Four from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and three from Seattle. And for the bike sharing systems, we had um, data from the Hubway in Boston, from City Bike in New York City, Capital Bike Share in Washington, and Nice Ride from St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So when we started plotting the data for all these different locations, all this data we had available, we observed um, that there was a um, pattern that was repeating um, over the year. So here we plot the, on the y-axis the monthly average daily um, bicycle traffic and the month of the year over about um, three years for a, a location in Ottawa in Canada. And we saw that um, we observed this sinusoidal pattern uh, that was repeating basically, um, as I explained earlier, during the winter months, we had low demand. During the summer months, we saw the demand increasing. So you see the data points and how well the sinusoidal fu function um, matches that. Um, here are the data from Portland for, the lo for six locations that we had. Um, and we observed again that for most of the cases, the sinusoidal um, function was predicting fairly well. We have a location at the Hawthorne Bridge that um, didn't match as well. So I welcome any comments from the locals that you have as of why that might be. Um, something to mention is in areas that don't have a lot of changes in their seasons, uh, like San Francisco, the model we're proposing wasn't really a good fit, right? So you have to have um, big changes in your temperatures and weather conditions in general. Um, and this is another graph that I thought you might find interesting since it's um, close by for um, Seattle. So the different lines represent different locations um, and how the monthly average daily uh, bicycle traffic changes over the years. So um, this is uh, just, I lost, I realized I lost my y-axis label. So it was a normalized monthly average daily bicycle traffic. I'll make sure that uh, we get the updated one uh, online. Um, so this basically is here to remind us of the different um, aspects of a sinusoidal function and how those correlate to the, correlate to the metrics we have um, related to bicycle demand. So the maximum uh, demand we have uh, is represented by this point and is the wave crest or the um, annual daily, uh, monthly annual daily um, bicycle um, traffic. We have um, the, minimal, the minimum one as the wave um, trough. The wavelength, which is equal to twice um, pi and the frequency of the sinusoidal. And the assumption we made here is that all cities and all locations had a period equal to one year, 12 months. Um, the amplitude is basically the seasonal change in demand between the average annual um, daily bicycle traffic and the maximum one. And the phase shift phi um, is expressed in months here and is there to basically illustrate how um, to basically shift the sinusoidal function in order to achieve getting um, the crest, so the maximum, oops, excuse me. So the maximum of um, the traffic demand at the month that we also observe the maximum um, bike demand. So this is the function that um, is uh, that basically is the sinusoidal function we're proposing. So the monthly average daily uh, bicycle traffic for any month T 
is a function of the annual average daily bicycle traffic plus the amplitude. So that difference in seasonal demand I, uh, I showed, so the difference between the maximum and the average. Um, and the sinusoid of the wavelength um, in a function of the month. So T would be 6 if it was June, 8 if it was, if it was August, and phi is the phase that we need to shift the sinusoidal function in order to achieve maximum for the month that we observe the maximum bicycle demand. So here are a few more equations. Um, the amplitude, um, as I described, can be expressed as a difference between the maximum and the minimum volume divided by two. And in order to calculate the annual average daily bicycle traffic, um, you can either do it by using continuous count uh, data from a whole year, so counting every year and dividing by 365 days of data, or if we don't have continuous count data available, we can actually utilize um, short-term counts from different months and utilize the um, monthly annual daily bicycle traffic, the maximum value and the minimum from the two months that you have, and divide that by two. Um, then we decided we wanted to basically um, assess how the seasonal demand, alpha, the amplitude alpha, changes as a function of the annual average daily bicycle traffic. So we plotted all the data for the six locations we had. Uh, we, we didn't utilize the bike sharing locations here. And we performed a linear regression that seemed to be matching um, the data fairly well. And the slope, so the regression factor alpha, uh, is basically what we call the seasonal factor and explains how, um, how fast basically the seasonal change in, dem in bicycle demand changes as the annual average daily bicycle um, traffic changes. So the alpha value can be calculated as a function of the minimum and maximum monthly average daily bicycle um, traffic. And when we performed that analysis for uh, all locations we had, all 35 locations. So those, we had 37 locations in total and we used 35 for calibration. Um, we saw different values um, of alpha. And something to note here is that as the temperature difference increases, so Ottawa was the um, city that had the highest change in temperature um, between summer and winter months. Um, uh, so the higher the, different in te the difference in temperature is, the higher the alpha factor is. So that means you have a higher seasonal change in your bicycle, bicycle demand between um, winter and summer months. Um, Seattle was the one that had the least. No. Portland was the one that had the least, which makes sense. Even though the difference in temperature is a little bit um, bigger than... Okay, so assuming now that we have um, this alpha factor utilizing short-term counts from, the, from two months that could be representative of the maximum and the minimum bicycle demand we have, um, we can uh, utilize for any month T, uh, you, you, we can use the count from any month T to calculate the annual average daily um, bicycle traffic. And from there, we can go back to the um, monthly annual um, daily bicycle traffic, monthly average, excuse me, um, and calculate for any month T what demand we would be expecting to have, assuming that our demand follows the seasonal pattern of a sinusoid. Uh, regarding the bike share demand data, we wanted to see if they follow a similar pattern, so we plot here the bike share data for, for um, the capital bike share system in Washington, D.C. Uh, from the time it started in 2010 um, until we had data until um, about September 2015. And we see that over the years there is an increase in um, demand for that system, which makes sense, right? The, a new system is introduced and people start getting used to it and um, more and more people are more prone to biking the last few years. Um, and also we saw, related to the alpha factor, we saw that we started from an alpha factor of, uh, I keep bumping this, I'm sorry, um, of 0.52 uh, 
Um, it went down to 0 0.37, 0 0.39, and it has kind of uh, plateaued to about 0 0.44, 45. So that means that as the years go by, there is less and less seasonal change in the bicycle demand, at least observed for this specific um, system. Um, alpha factors for the different uh, bikes, the other bike sharing systems, um, Hubway had the highest. And no, sorry, I didn't put them in order. I'm sorry. So nice ride in Minnesota had the highest. I was just wondering why Minnesota wouldn't have higher than us. But uh, I'm assuming everyone knows that it's very, very cold in Minnesota. So uh, we follow in, in Boston and Massachusetts, and then um, City Bike Share in New York City and Capital uh, Bike Share in Washington, D.C. follow. So in terms of validation, as I mentioned, out of the 37 locations we had continuous count data for, we took away two uh, locations, one in Ottawa in Canada and one in Arlington in Virginia. And the reason we chose those two locations were we were trying to choose them based on having availability of data for at least two years because um, we wanted to check the, the accuracy. So here we're plotting the monthly average daily bike bicycle traffic as a function of the month for uh, data from three different years. And the different colors in the lines represent um, the sinusoidal function we were getting as if we were using one of the months shown here on the right um, as our sample month. So we were assuming, what, what if we only had data from January, right? So if we had data, only data from January, uh, you would be getting um, this pink line here. And if we had data from July, you would be getting this one. That also turns out to be the best fit for the data. Um, so a similar pattern was observed for the data from Arlington. And basically the outcome from this is that you're better off and you're producing a more accurate model if you're utilizing data from the summer months rather than very sparse data from the winter months. Especially for Ottawa, that they don't really have that many bicyclists in the winter, so it completely skews the model um, in the wrong way. So um, we did a lot of tests, and I have a citation to the paper. We're reporting all those, and I'm happy to send it to anyone uh, that might be interested. Um, so in summary, the annual average daily bicycle um, errors varied between about 8.6% and 28%. Um, and the highest errors when as I mentioned, where, when we were using January as our sample month. And the monthly average daily bicycle errors varied between 5% and 42%. Um, again, we saw a similar pattern between using summer versus winter months for um, doing the estimation. And these errors are comparable with other methods. Um, in some cases, we even get better um, accuracy. Um, so it's not to say that the other models that exist out there are not good. It's just this specific model has the advantage of not requiring a lot of data. So you can even use it with uh, having two short-term counts from uh, a winter and a summer month. Obviously, the accuracy drops um, the less data you have, but at least you can have some preliminary estimate um, that you can use for, for example, a bicycle crash analysis that um, is what we were trying to do and we were led back to, oh, we don't have enough data, so we need to do something to estimate uh, bicycle demand. Okay, so once we calculated the annual average um, daily uh, bicycles and we obtained our crash data, um, we started by plotting where we had crashes in Cambridge. Okay, so the red, dot, uh, represent, the red dots represent the 622 bicycle um, collisions we had in our database. And we also tried here uh, thinking that we want to eventually understand how crashes are correlated with specific bicycle infrastructure treatments. Um, we also, also tried to identify where we had cycle tracks, where we had um, some type of, um, you know, shared roadway space between bikes and um, cars or um, no bicycle infrastructure. Uh, in addition, uh, the circular um, locations so the ones here illustrate where we had um, count data for um, 
bikes and cars. So then taking that into account, we were able to go from um, 30 locations. So, so basically what we assumed is that we assumed that uh, bicyclists are traveling on those corridors. So if you knew the demand at a location, for example, here, you would know that the demand here would also probably be similar, or at least that's the assumption we made. Um, and again, it might not be as accurate as if we had data, uh, demand data for all those locations, but we had to find a way, we needed a way to match all these crash locations with some uh, demand data. So that's why we call it the corridor um, analysis in order to align the crash data with the demand data we had. So this is a cleaner map of what we ended up um, having as our corridors. Um, so the assumed bicycle corridors were based on information we had about certain roadways and certain corridors that have bicycle infrastructure treatments, and we know that bicyclists uh, prefer them. Um, also, certain uh, corridors that we observed we had high bicycle demand, and we also chose them based on the uh, fact that we had vehicle and um, bike interaction, so any off road paths were excluded from um, this analysis. So the results from the crash uh, risk analysis we performed are um, illustrated in this, these two graphs. So the graph on the left shows the bicycle crash rate per million vehicles uh, on the y-axis, and on the horizontal axis we have the vehicle volume um, as either AADB, so annual average daily uh, bicycles, or AADT, annual average daily traffic. So what we see, we have noted here um, the same location, uh, Brookline and Gran Granite. So if we calculate, if we use the crash um, rate equation shown um, on the top of the slide to the left, this one, um, a, for and we divide it by the annual average daily bicycle traffic, so we use as D the annual average daily bike, bicycle traffic. Um, we get the orange triangle points, and we get for that specific location a bicycle crash rate of about 3.8, um, 3.9. If we, for the same location, if we divide by the annual average daily uh, traffic f for cars, then we get a much lower, about 0.5. So those, that tells us that, you know, depending on what metric you use, you're not really getting a represent, representative um, metric of whether that location is dangerous or not for bicyclists. Uh, while with the proposed, uh, what we call dual or double exposure uh, crash rate um, that you see on the right, on top of the, uh, on the right side, um, we get a crash rate of about 1.5. So the point I want to make here is that a lot of times if we utilize the um, commonly used equation with, and divide by the annual average daily traffic, we get very low crash rates that just because it happens that you have a lot of vehicles, or motorized vehicles traveling through that corridor. Um, and if you utilize the bikes, if you have a low uh, demand of bike, you get a high crash rate. But that is not necessarily representative of what the actual conditions are there. Um, we also plotted here um, along those corridors the crash frequency and the combined or double exposure crash rate. And we see um, that we have different, so we see that before, for example, if you just plot the crash frequency, you get locations like uh, this that don't seem to be that dangerous, right? because they only observed three, uh, one crest frequency here, one here, and one here. But then if you take into account how many bicyclists and how many cars are traveling through the, that corridor, that crest rate um, is a lot higher. So maybe this is actually a corridor you should be paying attention and um, do something to improve um, conditions for uh, bicyclists. So in conclusion, the novel components about the models we have developed is that um, this specific double crash rate accounts for exposure of bicyclists to both cars and other bicyclists. And it addresses data challenges associated with seasonality in demand and also lack of continuous count data um, that are often expensive and 
especially we're talking about small communities, they don't necessarily have the funding, the resources to go out there and collect data for um, years at multiple locations. Um, the limitations and something that this specific double uh, crash rate factor doesn't account for is um, the impact of autos versus the impact of bikes on um, the bicycle crash risk and also the outcome. Um, right? There's different if you crash with a bike versus if you crash with a car, although bike-to-bike -bike crashes um, can, can be very dangerous as well. Um, so going back to the seasonal demand model, the advantages are that you can estimate it just using two short-term counts. Um, you can estimate monthly average daily bicycles and annual average daily bicycles. And there are some considerations that are up for discussion um, related to the lack of seasonality. So as I mentioned earlier, we tried to fit the model to San Francisco data and it didn't work um, out because San Francisco demand is, bike demand is uh, more flat compared to other places that have uh, changes in their seasons and their temperatures. Um, the cyclist type um, is something we've been thinking about a lot. So the data we had did not allow us to distinguish between recreational cyclists versus commuters. Um, although we observed, uh, if one makes the assumption that bike sharing systems are often um, you know, utilized by recreational users, um, then we can tell that, you know, overall, if you combine all the users, then what we're proposing um, as a model for estimating the demand holds. However, it would be nice if we could have more disaggregate data and we can actually see changes in demand patterns uh, between the two types of users. And then um, if you have low counts or no counts at all, unfortunately, there's not much you can do. Uh, but at least we're proposing something that with the minimum amount of counts, um, you can have a rough, um, if you will, estimate to at least start your analysis and say something meaningful. So other ongoing, another ongoing project related to this work um, and how this work initiated, was initiated was we were, interesting to, we, were, we were interested in identifying um, how innovative, um, at least for where I live, <laughs> uh, bicycle infrastructure treatments I know they're much more common here, that's why I made that common, um, like bike boxes and um, cycle tracks. And so how do drivers that are not familiar with them behave when they encounter them for the first time? So for that, um, we have a project um, that was sponsored through the Safer Sim um, UTC. And we developed scenarios in the driving simulator we have at UMass. Um, and we actually tested um, how drivers would behave when, when, they, when they arrive at an intersection like this and they see the bike box, but they've never seen it. Potentially, they've never seen it before. We were actually um, asking them after they drove whether they had seen a bike box before or not. Um, and we're still running subjects for um, this experiment, uh, but what we've been finding so far is that drivers that are also bicyclists are more likely to be aware of you know, the potential of another bicyclist coming, especially when they see infrastructure treatments that are tar targeted uh, to improving safety for those users. Uh, but also even people that had never seen some of those treatments before, most of the times they were behaving correctly. And we had them drive uh, twice through them and the second time was certainly improvement. So uh, it means that they're well marked and self-explanatory in a lot of cases. Um, so we're continuing this work. We're very interested in identifying through real-world data the specific interactions between um, bikes and motorized traffic, especially when under the presence or, uh, or not of such treatments. Um, some acknowledgments, most of, uh, a lot of this work have been uh, done by me, my PhD student, Nick uh, Fournier, and in collaboration also with my colleague, uh, Mike Nodler. And... I uh, would also like to thank all the cities that um, provide their bicycle data. So uh, without those, this work would not have been uh, possible. And of course, the UMass uh, Safe Traffic uh, Safety Research Program for the CRAS data. Um, these are the two citations of the papers that this work came from. There's a lot more detail in there for anyone um, who might be interested. Um, and I'm happy to send them to you if you cannot uh, find them. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Your name is to reach it, student reaches for the class. Right. If you go 
go back to the map you had at the end, uh, where there was that exposure of eight. Um, if you look this at one? that location, yeah, on, on Google Maps, is, is there anything different there at that, that uh, you know, the high crash location? Uh, the high crash, crash rate, you mean this yeah. one? Yeah. Were you able to see, you know, from this data and the analysis that uh, there was something about the location or the type of facility or? I actually don't think there's any facility there. Let me go back to the other map and see if I can. So, sort of answer is I don't remember, but I'll try to figure it out. Uh, street was no, it actually did have, if it's this um, Huron Avenue, It did have, yeah. I don't, I don't have a good answer about that. I can, I can go back and check. And, but that's the next step. We didn't really see any, so the idea was to identify, uh, that's why we initially created this map, was to identify whether there's correlation between the different types of bicycle infrastructure. But we couldn't really tell anything from this initial analysis. So we need to go back and dig a little bit more and potentially collect more data. Yeah, uh, how important is the seasonality in this equation? Because you mentioned San Francisco, you couldn't do anything with it because there's literally no, and I live there, and it's just rain foggy all year round. But like, how important is the seasonality to this, using this equation? So um, if you don't have seasonality, then you can take any month during the year and basically know that you know that demand doesn't fluctuate much and use it, right? So the reason we came up with this model for places that have big changes um, over the seasons is in order not to be collecting data throughout the whole year, you can use this function to represent how your demand would be changing and then collect data on, you know, during one winter month and one summer month, maybe for a week or two, and then you should be able to say something about the whole year. Because in San Francisco you would collect in, I don't know, July is pretty cold, right? So you collect in July and you would say, okay, October would be the same or December would be the same. Um, but for places like in Boston, that changes a lot. So we need the model to, even if you have data from only two months, you could say something about the rest of the month. So, I mean, that was the, the motivation behind it. Yeah. So it's not important that they change seasonally, it's just if they don't change this model, it's not very useful. Richard Henry. Yeah, my name is Edgar. And just a question about the, the model, this to predict for the, the year. Can you use also to predict for the future? How would you do that? So if you assume that the demand doesn't change, um, then you could utilize the same model you have. If you have a case like the capital bike share, we have observed a, a pattern of increasing demand, right? So you can basically project that same increase in demand and um, and utilize the same model to assess, you know, what, to predict what you would have in a year or two, if you know how your demand is increasing. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about, so bike, it's great to have the bike crashes. As a city practitioner, you think about the nature of, we go out to an intersection, we look at the, you know, the complete street nature of it. Have you thought about combining this by focused effort towards a more comprehensive multimodal safety look so that you're including pedestrians in that sort of uh, analysis? Yeah, the only, I mean, certainly. And um, so for those that know also like the other, for those that don't know what other type of work I'm doing, um, I'm doing a lot with uh, multimodal um, signalized intersections. Um, and trying to improve person mobility for all users. So pedestrians is always something, you know, that I, I have in my mind, and I will eventually address the issues for all the users of the system. Um, the only problem I see with that is I'm guessing that there will be even less data available, which potentially a model like this could be, could be useful. Specifically, you know, you probably do have crash data for pedestrians as well as bikes. Yeah. So, yeah, so maybe we should go back and look at the database and identify a crash. It would be interesting to see if they're correlated, actually. 
for at least the Cambridge that we know we have the bicycle data. Did you all consider so the severity of the crash? So those locations of crashes were they? So is there any weighting towards like fatalities and other? No. Okay. We could, we could certainly do that. I mean, it just requires a little bit more digging in the reports. Well, specifically with bike traffic, I'm wondering about the the correlation between bike crashes and like freight. For instance, I mean the risk. I mean, million right. entering vehicles is, is a, obviously a circuit we've used for a long, long time. But certainly, the more turning movements you have, and the more heavier trucks, obviously the potential for severity goes up. Seemingly, goes up pretty high. We have. We certainly have. The, so the crash reports is whatever the police officer fills in when an accident happens. So my guess is that they would have that information. So. It's just a matter of going back and looking. But those are all uh, great points. Yeah, thanks. Does this data, um, does this data include the information like um, this is a right hook crash or this is a crash when a vehicle was parked and someone opened the door and someone just smashed onto that? So are these data like uh, tagged as those? Yeah, crashes? so. Um, that's a good question. So the way it works is they have a form, and then they can also write a narrative. So it depends on how many boxes and how much information the specific officer is filling in um, at the time of the crash, and you know what information they had, because they're not necessarily there when the crash happened. So it's whatever information they can collect, and um, it's up to them how detailed you know they want to be in their narrative. So for some we do, for some we don't. I would like to ask the online question by uh, Frank Probes uh, from Out of the Planet. So his question is about two questions. One is how were the portals selected? And uh, so there are maybe some concern that the, the so-called dominant uh, bicycle flow observed at a given location deviates from those selected corridors. And relatedly, uh, so with corridors, how many account for uh, the cross traffic? I mean, is those traffic are if the major flow, uh, the major road used by cyclists is not aligned with the selected corridor. So I'll start with the count question. So for for locations, we had. Um, let's say we had a specific intersection and we had count data there, we actually merged all the count data together. We didn't distinguish per direction. So if it was a high, you know, the, we were basically using demand data at a location accounting for all, all directions. Um, and the way we chose the corridors is we had, it was based on whether we had data or not, obviously, like cross data and, and bike data. And uh, based on whether we had high demand. So yes, the demand could be changing from one intersection to another, uh, but if we knew we didn't have major roads intersecting, you know, major cross streets intersecting in between, we made an assumption that the demand would be the same along that specific corridor. So again, um, it's, I'm, I'm not arguing that is the most precise way you can do this analysis, but if you don't have a lot of data, it's the only way to utilize what data you have and get the most out of it to at least have uh, an, a rough estimate of what's happening. Okay. Uh, additionally, DOTs use uh, day of the week and month factors, you know, to do this kind of demand calculations. So I guess like anyone in the DOT will say, well, did you compare you know, how that works versus, uh, you know, doing a week count and applying some factors uh, compared to using the, you know, the side of some uh, shape. So we compared, and we have the details in the paper, we compared against um, the proposed method, and I'm going to say the numbers wrong, but I think we get for, where are my results here? Um, I think the, the, the errors with that method were starting 
from about 15% and on, and we were observing that some of the months we had lower. Uh, on average, I would say it's similar. Uh, chatting about before the summer begins uh, is what do you think about the, the newer data sources such as Strava uh, or other uh, crowdsourced data sources that uh, their potential for uh, this type of or at least to provide additional data sources for this type of analysis? I think it could definitely be used with some adjustment factors to improve the calibration of, of the models. Um, the only problem would be that um, you might be getting the data from a specific um, group of cyclists that are, you know, more regular cyclists. So, but you also that also might be helpful to, you know, observe um, behavioral aspects of those bicyclists versus maybe more recreational bicyclists. And there are definitely a, a part that I'm really interested in. Um, they're definitely a great source of data to be able to identify root choice and connect that with. Um, the existence of bicycle infrastructure um, facilities or um, with information about high crash risk locations. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm just curious, um, that kind of relates back to your choice of you know, locations to pick and that kind of thing, and also with the round questions as well. Um, seems like a likely source would, would be kind of, or a likely choice would be accident places would be places where off-road or you know, off-traffic trails intersect with, with those type of mm -hmm. trails? Are there any of those, I guess, in the ones you looked at, were any of those identified as such? Is that a way to, I mean, it seems like people coming out of a park intersection are more likely, than, I guess that's why I have to study to see if that's true. Yeah. Uh, but is that any of that something you can identify or was identified in the selection of points you picked? No, so any, any crash on an off-road, on a roadway that is not shared with with uh, cars was excluded from this analysis. Uh, but we're actually very interested in this question, you know, let's say you have um, a separated bike bikeway or a bike path, and then as you, as you mentioned, it uh, comes to a point that it intersects with the rest of the traffic at, a, at an intersection. Is that more dangerous? Is that less dangerous? Because all this time you've had these bicyclists out of out of sight, out of mind, right? So cars are not even aware there's bicyclists around, and suddenly you introduce them to the stream. So it, it's another topic we actually um, has have some funding to start investigating uh, through the driving simulator. So hopefully, report on that later. is what if you see the next steps for this model? Uh, are you uh, further refining it or applying it to um, So we don't have any other data we didn't use um, for this model. Anything we had, we utilized anything we had so far. I would be very interested in somehow obtaining data to test the validity for different types of users, recreational users versus commuters. Um, I don't know if the data is available, but it would also be interesting to do the same crash analysis um, if there's other crash data available anywhere. Um, the database we have is Massachusetts based, so it would be interesting to see in other locations how, how it works. There is also a question uh, online about the value of alpha. And, you know, you think there is promise there in terms of trying to see, you know, what alpha means and the change of alpha over time in terms of, you know, what could be saying about cycling in the city? So I find it as a very interesting way of connecting climate with bicycle demand, um, especially, you know, when you know that the, the more severe your winters are, that factor can help you identify how much more that change is going to be um, in the bicycle demand you should be expecting. So. Related, I guess, to the question we had before, it would also be interesting to see how the demand changes and that factor potentially changes for different bicycle infrastructure um, uh, treatments. So if you have a separated bikeway um, 
would you be more willing to bike during the winter months if it was cleared off the snow? I, I don't know, but there's a lot of interesting questions that, assuming we have data to, um, to use, we can investigate further. Output. Do you use pipe share data to look at um, normalizing the data for tourism since summer months you might have more tourism to a city? No, we don't. We, we didn't, didn't do that because, um, so we couldn't, I guess some of them, so the Hubway data that they've looked in more detail has actually the inf some information about the users that are checking out the bikes. I don't know if that's true for all the other data we had available, but we were more interested, since we could not distinguish the data for the other locations that we have the continuous count counters, um, we were more interested in seeing as a total, does this pattern um, also occur with the bike sharing systems? But this is certainly um, a good point. Okay. Last questions? Uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, thanks, Dr. Chris.